Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, the Senate Redistricting Committee hears from rural residents about their concerns, and key lawmakers highlight new initiatives and funding plans in energy and human services. Plus, the Roy Wilkins Memorial gets a much needed restoration. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. The Census Bureau has released its 2020 data, which shows some areas in rural Minnesota losing residents while the state's metro areas are growing. The new data will be used to establish congressional and legislative districts that reflect the population changes. And lawmakers are beginning to hear from the public about their ideas and concerns. At a recent Senate meeting in Bemidji, rural residents urged lawmakers to protect rural representation. District lines should reflect people that live in them and not bipartisan interests. An example of this is, is that all the Ojibwe reservations have expressed concerns about the wild rice beds, with what are disappearing. Wild rice is essential and crucial to the Ojibwe people. Right now, district lines have made the campaign to preserve the wild rice beds, a drawn out process where those lines reflective of the native communities. This significant and vital issue would be addressed by a representative that would be willing to take up the issues that impact our communities. Rural Minnesotans need to be heard in St. Paul and Metro politicians don't understand and therefore don't place priorities on the issues that rural Minnesota communities are challenged with. Here are some of the issues and reasons why we need to have rural representation. Rural Minnesota has thousands of miles of roads with very low tax base for maintaining those roads. Sparsely populated rural areas have huge transportation costs busing students with higher fuel and labor costs over the many miles that they have to travel, transporting solid waste. From our county standpoint, we have large, large costs for higher fuel and labor costs, lack of affordable public transportation options for workers with limited access to reliable transportation. Agriculture by nature is exclusively a rural issue that needs legislators that understand it. Mining is also a rural issue, but needs different legislators than ag legislators in agriculture. Although ag and mining are both rural issues, they need to have separate representation that understands their needs. As you redistrict, we need the representation for the rural communities. Uh, it's different in my, in the western half of my district is basically farming. In the eastern half, it's basically tourism and logging. And uh, as we move forward, um, we need to have representatives that understand all of that. Townships there, there's 1,780 of them. They represent about 900,000 people in the state. And it's already been mentioned, but, but these are the centers of agriculture, logging, mining. Uh, and for anybody who drove up here yesterday from the Twin Cities, you saw the line of cars going the other way, that's tourism. Uh, these, are, these are areas that have a little bit different way of life because of how far they are from everyone else. Uh, it's very important to keep that rural representation. Uh, people who understand that, understand that it takes investment in those communities to support those industries. Uh, to give you an example, uh, townships provide 55,000 miles of road. It's a lot of gravel roads, so it's inexpensive, but there's still a lot to do. It still takes a lot of time and effort and investment. All of that supports all of those industries. Uh, we face an aging population in rural Minnesota. They have more difficulty getting to the places they need to be. That impacts not just transportation, but transit. We so often talk about metro transit, but rural transit is a real issue too. And how these lines are drawn will affect those issues. Uh, last one I wanna talk about is broadband. Townships remain the unserved places in the state. And that issue is connected to transportation and access to medical care. Uh, all of these other uh, impacts of life that broadband can have. Several weeks ago, I spoke with David Senjum, chair of the Senate Energy and Utilities Committee, about some of the initiatives in the latest Commerce and Energy budget. I began by asking him how the Natural Gas Innovation Act will help to move Minnesota away from its dependence on natural gas. It will over a long period of time, obviously, but the, so much emphasis has been put on power 
plants, utilities, emissions, and cars, and so on and so forth. And that's probably been discussed at this table, but uh, but not so much in the area of uh, how we heat our homes or natural gas, how we cook our meals, et cetera, dry our clothes, and 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 you know that's a fossil fuel as well. And so uh, Center Point Energy came to us early in the session last year and. Uh, and they're seeing the future with respect to natural gas. So we're not gonna shut off natural gas anytime soon for sure. But they also realize that uh, they have to do something with respect to how, you know, again, how we cook, how we heat, how we dry our clothes relative to natural gas. So, so they, they have, we have the Innovative uh, Natural Gas Act and the, that purports to look at, well, how can we, you know, does it all have to be fossil fuel? Can we, can we obtain it through anaerobic digestion, man, manure, et cetera, other organic materials? And or can we use hydrogen, which is probably the fuel of the future in our in our heating systems? Uh, and that's not to say we're going to have hydrogen in our in our you know heating our our, our dryers or our, our stoves or our furnaces immediately. But uh, what the way it's happening in this world is they're interjecting a little bit at the time, and and uh, you know maybe it's five percent, maybe it's ten percent, and so on. But incrementally, all that does is overall lessen emissions and so th there's a future there it's a long one but uh, again center point energy and a few other energy companies across the country are realizing that and believe that they need to get into some pilot programs to start exploring this further that's what this act is all and about. so this allows places like center point energy to begin that process to, right. it incentivizes them to continue to look yeah. for geothermal sure. i think i read and Geo other ways right, exactly of of Creating power for our homes, businesses, things like that. Exactly, and that's the, and, and the, again, they they understand that over time there'll be enough public pressure on those emissions because there's a lot of them. Just <laughs> you know, look look at the houses in the wintertime, and you can see the you know you can see the smokestacks, mm -hmm. so to speak, or the chimneys, and uh, and that's you know that's not smoke, that's that's just water vapor. But nonetheless, our homes use a lot of fossil fuel to keep them warm. Yes, they do. Um, there is money in this bill, two and a half million dollars, to promote jobs of the future by initiating a pilot program to train workers for clean energy careers. What do you hope pilot projects like this will achieve? Uh, so this is a pilot project specific in North Minneapolis. It's, it's, it's to some degree an equity project, uh, but what we hope it's going to achieve is, you know, further individuals that. Uh, are frankly now in the center of the city and, 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 and get them involved in, in renewable energy and renewable energy education and ultimately work uh, at, uh, at certain levels. Uh, we do, again, teach some of this certainly in our community technical colleges, but this is a unique little uh, uh, college or training place, training center in North Minneapolis that's going to somewhat do the same and prepare them then to get further certification within our community colleges. So, we think that's important. We think that we need more diversity, more equity in our, in the, in the, in the staff, the field staff that puts up wind, solar, et cetera, et cetera. This will help. Speaking of education, um, in the coming months, new installations of solar panels may begin to appear on school buildings. And that activity of solar panels on school buildings may even make it into curriculum, teaching kids about renewable energy. This is the Solar on Schools grants. What more can you tell me about this? Well, it's uh, something that we've done, just touched into, but we're getting into a little bit stronger now. $8 million, actually $16 million statewide. And uh, that's to assist schools in a couple of ways, certainly from the standpoint of, of uh, educating the kids, uh, but also from the standpoint of, uh, if you will, holding down energy costs within schools. It, you can, it, it, they can do this in a very significant way. Uh, but again, the, the kids will learn. Uh, it's, a, it's a training tool. It's a teaching tool. Actually, this year, uh, in this particular bill, we added one little uh, inclusion there, and that's that uh, in going into any, any of these school buildings that have it, there will be a little meter on the wall. It will tell you what the solar panels are generating and what they have generated over the course of, say, the past year or so. Uh, again, uh, it will be there for the public to look at and be curious about and things like that. So it, again, just to further expose, uh, again, uh, our students to the, the future of energy, and that's uh, solar is part of that. And speaking of solar, um, there's $5 million per year for the next two years that will go to Xcel Energy for their solar rewards program so homeowners can get some help incorporating solar power into their homes. And I, ha I have to admit, I've looked at solar panels. It has seemed cost prohibi prohibitive yeah. to me. But I wonder how important are efforts like this to get you know your average person like me to take that next step? Well. It 
you know, it's an enticement. It, it, it's a couple thousand dollars, and that that may kind of swing the deal for you and uh, or anyone else. And so, yeah, we think it we think it's important. Uh, we you know want to see you know more personally powered, if you will, uh, generation off people's houses. And uh, and to the extent we can have that, uh, we'll have to produce less in larger facilities. So it 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 all adds up over time. This is a long term you know process, so to speak, but. Uh, we're just sort of trying to decentralize energy, but also, uh, uh, again, this homegrown energy, so to speak, is uh, is part of the totality of what we need to go forward. Um, back to the jobs and and you know citizens, towns, you know some some places in Minnesota get a lot of their tax base from the power plants that exist where they are. Um, some of those power plants are going to shut down. So the Department of Employment and Economic Development, or DEED, has developed a grant program for uh, communities that have lost or will lose their coal-fired nuclear energy or natural gas facilities um, run by public utilities. I think Becker may be a city that is confronting this issue. What do communi communities facing these kinds of changes need to know about this program? Well, it, they need to know that it's, it's, it's vitally important and vitally important to the state. Uh, uh, I, I would say, and people don't realize this, and it only became, I became aware of it maybe just a couple of years ago, uh, by about 2035, which is, you know, all in, uh, 15 years or so, maybe 14, uh, there will not be a power plant, maybe with the exception of the Monticello nuclear power plant running in Minnesota that's, that's producing energy today, on, on, on a hot Minnesota day. Uh, and so we have a lot of work to do in terms of, uh, of catching up. And, and these plants, uh, along with them, as they do uh, finish their, their life cycle, so to speak, uh, have a lot of employees and, uh, and a lot of tax base associated with that. Tremendous effects, whether it's Oak Park Heights or Red Wing or, or Monticello or, or, or anywhere else. Uh, that, that has a major power plant. These these people are uh, going to be affected. These communities are going to be affected. So how do we now, uh, 14 years earlier, uh, begin to uh, uh, kind of face this problem with the, with these communities and try to keep them as whole as possible and, and let them move into a different kind of future? So that's what this is all about. It's important. Uh, and uh, we, we the other thing we did do here, and it's a different bill, but uh, uh, as these utilities close down, there's also a, a bill, Senator Matthews' bill, that has to do with the, these employee you know, benefits. You know, how do we tra retrain them? How do they keep their pensions or, or you know, keep, keep what they have alive that uh, through no reason of their own uh, is going away uh, simply because of changing times? Finally, before we go, there was a ceremonial bill signing this week by Governor Walls for the ECO Act. Now, Senator Jason Merrick is the one who carried this legislation, but when it was passing on the Senate floor, you called it landmark. Um, it's also being touted as an example of democracy at work. Can I have your final thoughts on the ECO Act of 2021? Yeah, it's a, it, well, it's, it's a great bill, uh, understand that. But, but we talk so much about new generation and all this stuff, uh, but this is about conservation. Uh, the kilowatt you don't have to produce is the, the cheapest kilowatt you can have. And so we're talking here about new ways to conserve energy and, and enticements for utilities to, to use to, in fact, cause us to use less energy. And uh, whether it's different kinds of, whether it's a heat pump or whatever, whatever it might be, uh, some enticements, some reba rebates, uh, not unlike the, the little light bulbs a utilities company used to give off, but uh, give away rather, but mm -hmm. <laughs> they've given them all away. And so there's no more, there's no more way to save energy here. This, this will take us to a different step. So it's a good thing. Senator David Senjum, always a pleasure. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much, Anna. For more than 20 years, Roy Wilkins was the executive secretary of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. The Spiral for Justice Memorial on the Minnesota Capitol grounds commemorates his work for racial equality. I spoke with recently retired CAP Board Secretary Paul Mandel about the memorial and its recent renovation. Roy Wilkins is credited with helping to achieve some of the greatest civil rights advancements in U.S. history. What else is important to know about him? Well, he was local. He was a local um, hero, basically, back in those days. Worked through the law system, which is why this whole, the, 
the spiral ends up pointing towards the, the, the judicial building. Um, unlike Martin Luther King, who worked outside the system, um, Wilkins worked through the system and was working through the legal processes. Um, so that's the main distinction point. Um, he did go on to national repute, and of course he's got the, the Wilkins Center here in, Minis in St. Paul and such. Between the plaque and the doors that we are interactive, it tells more about his history and what impacts and some of the quotes that he had. What do the quotes tell us? The quotes are sort of give you an, um, an insight into both the times that he was working with and his thoughts, because um, everyone knows Martin Luther King and not everyone knows of Roy Wilkins. So if you start from this end, you get a bar relief of his face and some biographical, and then various quotes that sort of either depict the time or his work or his thoughts. Um, sort of his version of the I have a dream type thing. What is the significance of the spiral shape and of the actual shape of the sort of pyramid type things? I'm not quite sure if he was uh, modeled somewhat after the, like the Washington Monument, but it's, a, it's purposely ascending as he started his work and became more and more prominent and became more and more involved. It starts off, you know, from his years of leadership, basically markers in time that where he was struggling and not getting anywhere. And then as, as, the, um, as the pieces rise, he's getting more and more influence and getting more and more known and having more and more success to the point when in the final end, it all points to the judicial center with the reliquy at the end, of, at the end point. What, what about the, the flooring around the spirals? What is that supposed to represent? It's all representative of African um, either symbols or patterns, sort of like the, the, the Hmong flooring is very, very uh, representative of their, of their uh, designs. But it's, it's repetitive and it's purposely chained off because in the winter it gets very slippery with the ice and uh, bronze also heats up so it gets a lot of sun and a lot of heating which is why we have wood benches um, they're, they're actually wood coverings because the bronze benches when we first had them some people got actually hurt by sitting on them in the middle of the summer oh, ouch. so we put some teak wood on top of them the memorial recently underwent a renovation. What had happened to it over time and what needed to be done to restore it? This is all bronze and the first patination job had been done under extreme weather conditions and it really didn't take well and then it had been vandalized over time. The doors had all been broken either accidentally or intentionally so some of them were broke, were uh, always open, some of them wouldn't open or some of them were dangerous when they open and shut So because they're on fulcrums. It needed complete stripping down and a repatination. So we chose the color based on the original intent, which was sort of a warm, light bronze. And so they repatent, stripped it all down, repatinated it, and then waxed it all so it would stay like this. Um, so it won't change color over time. So it won't change color over time. It won't become the green that we see copper happening. Minnesota has allocated $18.8 .8 billion over the next two years for Health and Human Services, with some funding specifically designed to improve the lives of Minnesotans with disabilities. Jim Abler, chair of the Senate Human Services Reform Committee, joined me recently, and I began by asking him what measures or changes will enable people with disabilities to live more independently. $18 billion is a lot of money, and so it's amazing for all the money we spend in this arena how certain areas have a hard time uh, being successful. One of those has been helping people with disabilities live independently. We've been working on this with Senator John Hoffman and myself and others and advocates to try to get people to have a real chance to be independent where they can be. And so if this bill were titled to be independence, we mean it. And so we've got informed choice, we've got housing options, we've got service options where people can try to be moving to be independent and we put some teeth into it. And I'm pretty proud of it, actually. We increased a bunch of rates for the service providers so they can be available to have help at their apartment. We tried to work on some shared services. And it's really complicated, but it's kind of simple. Like, aren't they people? Can't they just live? And so why is it them? And so they're just us. And so 
Uh, that's what we, uh, I think we really accomplished. And I think that as we look back, this is going to be a turning point in independence. And you mentioned Senator John Hoffman. The two of you have been fighting for some time for pay increases for personal care attendants, um, PCAs, as you just said. And that effort has been achieved. Will the competitive wage help with the shortage of workers? I think so. And actually, the interesting thing, people think we just fight around. I hear the House and the Senate, Republicans, Democrats. We went into our conference time together with the House and the Senate. We both wanted to shore up the PCA program. We had different ways to do it. And as it could be, um, it came out better than both sides went in with. And so PCAs are going to get a wage increase, uh, maybe $15. Um, and, and then with a framework going forward, which means there'll be increases coming automatically. They can help people drive their, their client to the, buy socks, which was forbidden. They can maybe, they, we're working on a plan to help them go to the hospital with their client, which they can't do. Like, this stuff is common sense. And so, uh, in addition to those, we actually increase the rates for um, home health workers and seniors and assisted living. Try to find everybody have a chance to, uh, to be as independent as, and have as many opportunities as they can have. This week uh, at the Capitol, home care workers and advocates rallied as part of President Biden's American Jobs Plan in the hopes of achieving a livable wage for home health care work. The idea is to unionize. I wonder what your view is of this. Well, and, you know, unions are a mixed bag. You have to pay money to be in one. The SEIU uh, unionized some of the PCAs, and that actually made a difference. And so what you want to make sure is how do you help a person go into home care or will be a PCA as a career choice? You have to have decent pay, you have to have benefits, you have to have the hope that it's going to be a survivable career. Many, many people want to do those, that kind of work, but they simply can't afford it. So they go to some other job that they hate and they leave the job that they loved. And so if it helps, it's worth discussing. But just so you know, in this bill, we increased the base wage. Um, by like 5% and then built in a framework for more increases. So maybe in Minnesota, the job is already well underway. Several lawmakers spoke glowingly of the parent-to-parent -parent peer support groups. Uh, customized living quality improvement grants were also mentioned on the Senate floor. Um, th there are a number of grants and programs to enable some of these things that you're talking about. Um, how, how does some of this work? Who is served? Well, it, it was a really productive time and I have to you know, the, have to remind everybody that this was this bill was influenced heavily by a huge influx of federal cash. 8.6 billion went to Minnesota. 1.2 billion went to this bill, and that money went to the half that I represent, the human services side, mostly in human community, home and community-based services and child care. And so we had a 680 something million dollars to put into the home and community-based side, and 530 some million into the child care side. So we're able to leverage all kinds of cool things, and then some we chose to keep paying for out of the state's cash. Um, Parent-to-parent -parent peer support. If you have a child with disability and you go through that and you've learned a lot, you have, now you have a young mother, young father who has no idea what they're doing. Wouldn't it help to have somebody tell you what's going to happen and how to navigate through? The customized supports, that's assisted living. And so we doubled the program from half a million to a million dollars a year to give Assisted living places, small grants, $20,000, $30,000 to go to something innovative and to help keep people mobile and healthier. And it's amazing when you uh, create little grants like that, the innovation at the local level, what they can actually do on a, on a project that spends millions of dollars a year. But this 20000 is like a little extra juice to do something special. And the reports of those are remarkable. So we doubled it this year. Access to child care, you were just speaking of child care, had reached crisis levels even before the pandemic. Uh, since there are even more challenges, there are investments in child care in this bill, including raising the reimbursement rates and some efforts at stabilization. What else is going to help with this child care piece? Well, we have, uh, we being us, the feds, uh, dropped money and rained money on the state in child care with different kinds of grants through the time, public health grants, we call them, to keep people open. And so um, those are still in the bill. There's $304 million in this bill going out over two and a half years to assist uh, every child care place. We, still, though, we've lost half of our licensed homes over the last you know, five years or so, uh, which is a real problem. And so how do we try to support them? There's, there's money, th those grants maybe will help, but it seems like it's hard. Um, we also have some money. We did increase the rates for the CCAP 
the child care assistance program for the people that are on assistance programs to get a little better rate, for, especially for infants and toddlers. We also have some money to help fix up your place, uh, some grants through DHS to help do some, some modest repairs to get a little better, you know, whatever, something for your kids. And so I hope that that's going to make a difference. But at the end, um, it's really important, and it's a statewide challenge to have enough child care to facilitate the workforce. The legislature continues working on ways to improve access to affordable housing in Minnesota, but at this time, homelessness is still a problem. What supports are available to help people out of homelessness? Well, and I worked with a representative, Aisha Gomez, on this. Um, this is a big deal, Anoka. I mean, every, every place has challenges, and part of it is having enough funding to support who needs the supports. Um, the emergency services program was under a million dollars a year, now it's six. And so that was a true commitment to help at least the emergency side. But part of what we really have to get after is how did they get there? What mental health issue, what substance use, what disability? Uh, almost half of them have a disability of some kind. And back to what, how to be independent, how to be supported, just be cast off, to hang around. And so at some point you have to get to the source and try to stem it there. But we tried to at least deal with the symptom in this bill. And I think as we've been working on independence and supports of people with disabilities and substance use and mental health, all of which this bill is full of as well and not enough time even to talk about it, perhaps we can stem the tide and give everybody a chance to succeed and have a, in a kind of abundant life like we've been all hoped that everybody could have. One final question. As the state continues to emerge from the pandemic, uh, perhaps a labor shortage becomes even more significant due to demographic changes. What concerns do you have for Minnesota's more vulnerable residents? What's on the horizon? Well, there's labor issues everywhere. Even without the pandemic, there was labor concerns just because there's not enough human beings to serve the boomers and then the group after that. All the, some of that sometimes they do help and it makes it worse. Uh, the federal money, the $15 an hour, um, 600 bucks a week to stay home when you only make $13 an hour, really put a plug in that. So I, I think part of the best thing that'll happen is when that money goes away and we can get back to people having to work. You know, work is healthy. Work gives people structure and it gives them some pride in their life. And hopefully we can find jobs that people are taking pride in that they can make a difference about. And in the home health field, the healthcare field in general, there's so much opportunity for pride and joy and helping somebody. And then sometimes as you help somebody else, you kind of feel better about you. And, and some of those issues you get to work through. And we all struggle. I mean, people think that just because we're dressed nice sitting here, that we have nothing on our mind. We struggle every day, at least I know I do, and not speaking for you. But, and so how do we help people sort their way through? That's the real purpose of the human services system. Take a person in challenge, move them through to uh, independence, and maybe even prosperity. So, and. and we agree on that in a bipartisan way. Senator Jim Abler, so good to see you in person. Thank you. Thanks again. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.